greatest hits of 1987. Baby! Welcome back to the countdown of 1987's biggest selling smash hits from 30 to number one. And if you didn't love Stock Aitken and Waterman, you were in trouble. They were everywhere. And here's their first entry on our chart. Yep, only the first. Got no reason to be tied down. Got my mates, got my flag, got my brand new car. And a ticket to the club with a toy boy's up. We don't need men hanging around. 1987, the year that Stock Aitken and Pete Waterman changed the musical world. They had a sound, they had a style, they had a system. They were going to milk it. A young record executive called Simon Cowell used to regularly come into the studio and his label, Fanfare Records, had had a big club hit with Sunita and was struggling to find a follow-up for it. He would often turn up to our PWL reception uninvited. He was coming in and just hustling <laughs> to get Stock Hagen Alderman to finally work with Sunita and that happened after possibly six to nine months of, of pushing them to do so and they came up with Toy Boy. And it was just lots of fun. People saw it as a bit of a kind of women's lib kind of track, which is not necessarily how I meant it at the time, but it was me sort of extolling the, the benefits of dating someone my own age as opposed to someone who was many, many years older. I could do with a Toy Boy now, to be honest. At 13, sadly, stars of pop had to pull together once more when tragedy struck. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. That Let It Be Fairy Aid record was a big achievement, and we made the record in two days. Uh, uh, was mixing it by the Monday uh, and had it in the shops by the end of that week. It was just uh, uh, an incredible experience. I was very flattered to be amongst all the best of the best, really. It's a real who's who in, in pop. Mark Knopfler plays a solo. He appears to have brought about 20 guitars to the studio, He's sitting there surrounded by guitars. And then, of course, you get the other solo, the more kind of metal one, from uh, Gary Moore, who appears to have come in his dressing gown. And by the time you get to the big choir at the end with everybody let it being... Pretty big names, and there's Rick Astley's over there, and Errol Brown, Susie Quattro. They didn't get their own little moment in the sunshine. I give. Don't worry, they're not done yet. Mel and Kim were just a good-looking duo, and them. Getting their groove on. Tay, 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 tay. What a tune. It's our occupation, we're a dancing nation. We keep the pressure on every night. These two girls arrived on the scene, bubbly, East End, full of energy girls, and Stock Ake and Waterman were, uh, were always fantastic at writing songs especially for the artists and trying to capture some of their character. They brought such energy with them. There was absolutely no shadow of a doubt that the records were going to be energetic. To me, was like the best of Stock Aitken Waterman because it was a little bit of the sort of classically trained musicians and you know very 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 skillful, but then they added the sort of pop. That was that was the beginning really. So here we are, the top selling song of the year. But who's in pole position? Clues, please. I think for many of us, this is where um, we all have our fondest memories of being on the disco dance floor. It's a great record and it's a great vocal. And it's actually 
a great song. That song was one of many reasons why I wanted to, to sign to Pete Waterman because, you know, the sound was just fantastic. <laughs> Yes, it was just the start of Stock, Aitken and Waterman's global chart domination that went through the rest of the 80s and beyond. And it was all thanks to the Studio T-Boy. You know so Pete Waterman signed Rick Astley as an artist with the intention of developing him as a solo artist. And he only told that to Mike Stock and Matt Aitken in the building. So uh, our initial meeting with Rick was, you know, I take mine with milk and no sugar, thanks, Rick. Cheers. The, the boy next door until he opens his mouth and then boom, that voice. We first heard Rick Ashley before everybody thought he was black. White guys didn't sing baritone, really. Now, this guy came out with... And so do I. That's what sorts out the men from the boys. It's all right having a baritone, but can you go up that octave? And he could. That was what made him different. I knew, honestly, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I knew that if I could get him on, get him on top of the pops with a hit, the public next day would never forget Rick Astley because of what he sounds like. And that's exactly what happened. 